They are titans of the rails, weighing almost a half million pounds. Highly efficient at performing their job of hauling freight and passengers throughout the world. However, when accidents occur, the results are devastating. But scientists, engineers, and government safety experts are discovering ways to stop the runaway trains. Almost every hour, somewhere in the world, a train derails, collides with another train, or slams into a car at a railroad crossing. Trains travel under hazardous conditions that endanger passengers, crews, and community. Train accidents kill and injure thousands of people every year worldwide. Mile-long freight trains derail, spewing hazardous waste. Passenger trains crash in fiery head-on collisions. Commuter trains ram into cars at crossings. In the U.S. alone, there are more than 2,500 railway accidents a year resulting in the deaths of over 1,000 people. An additional 14,000 people are injured in train accidents. More than 10,000 are evacuated from their homes or affected by environmental contamination from hazardous materials spilled in train wrecks. force of some of these wrecks can be overwhelming. A modern passenger train can carry, you know, 100, 110 people per car. Uh, an inner city passenger train could maybe have three to 500 people on it. It's a very safe form of transportation. But when it would collide with another train, uh, it could have catastrophic effects. Well, it's, uh, it comes right down to the law of physics. Um, the trains are very, very massive. Uh, a locomotive weighs somewhere on the order of 220 to 260,000 pounds. And uh, when you have an accident with something that big, uh, the devastation has to happen. It's just so massive. There's so much energy that has to be dissipated. The high desert of Southern California. The steep El Cajon Pass is the mountainous entryway to the Los Angeles Basin. The Cajon Pass is one of the most difficult and notorious grades in the United States. Freight trains traveling down the pass can be a mile long and weigh up to 15,000 tons. As many as 100 trains a day struggle against the laws of gravity when navigating this treacherous route. More than 5,000 tons are pushing against the lead locomotive as the tracks dip down the 3.2% grade. It is a struggle the trains sometimes lose. Yo, 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 yo. On the morning of May 13, 1989, a quiet neighborhood at the bottom of the 24-mile pass was rocked by an out-of-control train. A runaway freight train sailed down the Cajon Pass and careened off the tracks. As it plunged down a 30-foot embankment, it tore through seven homes before coming to rest in a huge pile of twisted steel. 
Computer animation demonstrates how the accident occurred. The train hit the curve at 105 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour over the recommended speed. All six locomotives and 69 cars derailed. I think the call came in as a traffic collision and we rolled on it and it was really different. We're looking for vehicles that had crashed into each other. Around in the corner we stopped and uh, it was just, you know, it's hard to fathom to see all these train cars that were just like, you know, stacked on top of each other. The wreckage piled up in a grotesque heap of twisted metal. Hundreds of tons of sodium carbonate spilled from the cars into the yards, houses, and streets. The first rescue workers were met by a surreal scene. Smoking, twisted wreckage, destroyed homes, and confused and injured people. All of the neighborhood people flocked to us and everybody was yelling, screaming that there was people trapped in one house and there was one house that was totally demolished and all you could see was just the white potash over it. Specially trained dogs were flown in to search for trapped survivors. The dogs located the scent of a man in this wreckage that moments before had been his home. After 15 hours of digging, the man was miraculously discovered alive under 10 feet of rubble. Violence of a, of a train car coming off of his tracks, going through a house, like taking a matchstick or a toothpick and breaking it in half. There's no holding it back, nothing. I was totally in awe when I saw this, the, the destruction of those train cars. I mean, tons and tons of steel coming through your home. Um, it was just unreal. Three people were killed and ten were hurt in the accident. An investigation revealed that the train's brakes failed because it was overloaded. It was a disaster no one thought would be repeated. But 13 days later, the same neighborhood was jolted by an exploding petroleum pipeline that had been damaged during the train accident. A geyser of flames shot nearly 300 feet into the air. The resulting fire killed two people and destroyed 11 more homes. Everybody was running from the area. It was an intense heat. From a block away, it was, it was so much heat, you didn't want to get any closer. Five people died. 21 were injured, and property loss exceeded $14 million as a result of the accidents. The remains of the crushed houses were eventually cleared away, but the scars of the accident linger as a constant reminder of the disaster. While safety officials and the railroads debated what should be done to make the treacherous past safer, another train lost control. On December 14, 1994, a Santa Fe freight train's brakes failed due to a blockage in the brake line. The runaway accelerated to 50 miles an hour before it crashed into a parked Union Pacific coal train. The two crew members survived but were severely injured when they leaped from the locomotive. The accident caused more than $4 million in damage and once again showed the need for better safety measures. However, action was not taken soon enough. Two years later, just before dawn on February 1st, 1996, a freight train neared the summit of the Cajon Pass. The engineer brought the train to a halt and waited for the signal to proceed with his descent. As the train came down the mountain, it started to gain speed. The recommended speed going down the grade is 15 to 20 miles an hour. The engineer applied the train's air brakes, but it did not slow as it hit 40 miles an hour. He continued to apply pressure to the brakes. Nothing slowed the train. It reached nearly 65 miles per hour when it hit a sharp curve. 
the train hurtled from the rails and exploded into a fireball. Here was about a three and a half, four story high pile of what had been rail cars. It was like somebody dug a hole and just kept shoving them in. And they were sitting there all helter skelter in this pile. And, and the fire was just phenomenal. I've seen very few fires that looked as incredible as this one. If you can imagine a, a, a mess of, uh, a mass of burning tangled wreckage on a football field that's about four stories high, you can imagine what we saw. Computer animation shows the four locomotives and 49 cars jumping the tracks and the resulting fire. Toxic chemicals spewed from the burning wreck. Fearing that a toxic cloud would spread, the main artery between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, Interstate 15, was shut down for more than 30 hours, and nearby homes were evacuated. We obviously didn't want any, uh, anybody driving through that cloud in case there was some very toxic or poisonous uh, properties in, in the smoke. Two of the three crewmen were killed when they jumped from the runaway train. One of the victims was the brakeman, Kevin Williams, who died upon impact. The other victim, Gilbert Ortiz, was consumed by the blazing inferno that resulted from the wreck. A memorial to the crewman now overlooks the accident site. The engineer, Lester Foster, stayed on board the train and lived. An investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board determined that the probable cause of the accident was a blocked brake hose. A train's brakes are applied using air that is pumped the length of the train. If one of the air hoses is blocked, the air pressure can't get through and all the cars behind the obstruction are left without brakes. As a result of the derailment that occurred in 1996, all trains are now equipped with an end of train or EOT device. The EOT is a brake valve that allows the engineer to apply the brakes from the rear of the train by radio command. Today, we have requirements that require that these trains have two-way into train devices. Uh, and that these two-way into train devices be operational. So today, the Cajon accident could not happen. And since that accident, the Santa Fe has, has just been wonderful in the different initiatives that they've put together uh, to make sure that trains coming down this hill are brought down safely. One reason officials are so concerned about the consequences of any train wreck is the type of cargo that is now carried. Many trains carry lethal chemicals, highly toxic cargo that if spilled can kill. Any wreck involving a toxic load requires special handling. Highways are closed, homes are evacuated, lives are put at risk, and huge areas have to be decontaminated. On March 4, 1996, a hazardous materials team battled a propane blaze for nearly three weeks after a train derailed in Wyowego, Wisconsin. A month later, over a thousand people had to be evacuated near Alberton, Montana, when a freight train derailed and spewed chlorine gas. A cloud of toxic fumes estimated at eight miles long and four miles wide covered the town. Hazardous material is a growing business for the railroads. Some of these hazardous material that they, they carry can be very, very dangerous to the public. 
We've had accidents where we've had bombs carried on trains and the bombs have been laid, laying around the wreckage. Nothing exploded, but uh, you know, there, there's all types of things out there. As modern trains become faster and more powerful, the emphasis on railway safety has grown more acute. Examining where railroad safety started, the accomplishments to date have been remarkable. In the early 1800s, trains were somewhat quaint transports that didn't go very fast. But by the turn of the 20th century, advancements in design and horsepower increased the speed of trains. Locomotives were built with all steel bodies, and they became as strong as battleships. As the amount of train traffic increased, accidents began to occur at alarming rates. Worldwide, people developed a morbid fascination with train wrecks. Pioneering filmmakers and stuntmen often risked their lives to capture exciting train stunts on film. In the U.S., state fairs featured staged train collisions. These wrecks drew crowds like monster truck rallies or demolition derbies do today. It was a chance to safely see two snorting steel centaurs hurtle towards certain destruction. In the 1950s, differences began to emerge in the way countries use railroads. Due to the vast size of the continent and newly constructed interstate system, the United States moved toward the airplane and the automobile for personal transportation. Passengers abandoned trains, and U.S. railroads were mostly used for heavy freight hauling. In other countries, passengers continued to rely heavily on trains. And when trains wrecked, the results were often devastating. If you look in the newspaper, you'll find that uh, every country has its share of accidents, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in Germany, whether it's on, uh, in France. Every country has their share of tragic accidents. Of course, some areas of the world are still more dangerous than others. India is known for its horrendous wrecks. Overcrowded trains contribute to the abnormally high death tolls in the country's train accidents. In, in India, you have uh, tremendous pressure on the railways. They have very long trains. They have extremely crowded trains. Uh, a Bombay commuter train, for example, will carry typically four and a half thousand people. And when people are jammed in like that, clearly, if you do have a train wreck, uh, a lot of people are going to get killed. You do get them holding onto the side of the train. Under those conditions, of course, uh, a great many people get killed in every year simply by falling off. The continued heavy use of the rails by passengers and the occasional calamity prompted several European countries to develop innovative safety measures. In England, a horrific train accident in 1952 caused the British rail system to rapidly adopt a new automatic warning system. This is the Harrow Wealdstone station, just outside of London. With the exception of these modern trains, it looks much like it did 45 years ago. October 9, 1952 began as a foggy fall morning. Over 1,000 people clogged the station platform. Nearly 800 of them were London-bound commuters who pushed their way into a local train as it sat next to the platform. Hurtling toward the station was an express train from Perth in Scotland. The driver or engineer missed a warning signal outside of the station, instructing him to slow down. The southbound train burst out of the morning mist and barreled into the sitting commuter train. The force of the steel locomotive splintered the wood passenger cars. Some of the wreckage was flung onto the northbound track. Moments later, 
an oncoming train traveling at 60 miles per hour slammed into the crushed cars that were filled with passengers. Witnesses remember seeing bodies flying through the air. The station clock was stopped at 8.19 by the force of the impact. The area became a tangled, twisted mass of engines, passenger cars, and bodies. One heard a terrific crash, and our coach was hit in the rear by the fast train. I remember distinctly uh, our coach reared up by the locomotive on the Perth Express. One heard the uh, crunching of metal and the splintering of the wood. Uh, and suddenly our coach turned completely upside down. And at this point, I was knocked unconscious. Using computer animation, the actual events of the accident can now be seen for the first time. Traveling over 60 miles per hour, the Perth to London Express tore into the parked commuter train. Then, within moments, disaster struck again. The Manchester Express, also late and trying to make up for lost time, barreled into the station and slammed into the wreckage. The Manchester's two huge engines were propelled off of the tracks and into the air. They sailed above the crowded platform and then crashed down, spewing scalding steam. Rescue teams and townspeople quickly descended on the station to search for survivors. They found a grisly scene of mangled bodies and twisted metal. Chaos ensued as they tried desperately to rescue the most seriously injured. There was wreckage all strewn over two platforms and track and carriages literally everywhere. And the uh, main line express, which was a double steamer coming out from Euston, had plowed up on top of the existing wreckage, which caused a, well, gigantic heap of wreckage and to get to some of the carriages was very awkward. The day in question, uh, I worked there till two o'clock and we was pulling bodies and live people and dead people out all the time. The image from my eyes as we was going round the scene was like a gigantic scrapyard uh, with metal everywhere. It was England's worst rail disaster in history. 123 people were killed and 150 injured. No one could explain why the driver didn't see the warning signal. Investigators sought ways to prevent similar accidents in the future. The results of their investigation prompted the widespread introduction of an automatic warning system. An accident such as that had happened it couldn't happen today on the main lines of Britain because all the main lines have been equipped with automatic warning signaling, which is a device which warns the driver if he's passing a caution signal. And if he doesn't acknowledge that warning, it automatically applies the brakes. The warning system continues to be improved upon today, and it is credited with significantly reducing the number of railway fatalities in England. While the main business of railroads in the United States is freight hauling, there are still a few areas where a well-developed passenger train system is thriving. The Northeast Corridor between Washington, D.C. and Boston is one such place. When mistakes occur here, they are often fatal. On the evening of February 16, 1996, a full load of commuters were on their way home aboard a Maryland area rail commuter train, or MARC train. They were getting close to their destination, Washington, D.C.'s Union Station. It was Friday night, and many were looking forward to the weekend. The Mark train was moving along at a pretty good clip, over 60 miles per hour. 
40 miles away an Amtrak passenger train, the Capital Limited, pulled out of Union Station. It was running late on its way to Chicago. 30 minutes later, the Amtrak train and the Mark train crashed in a fiery head-on collision. I remember that day very distinctly because um, we were just getting ready to sit down to have dinner. And the phone rang and said, you guys got a train wreck. We just dropped and we were all out the door. Rescuers had to battle their way through a steep, densely wooded area. As they arrived on the scene, they discovered a blazing inferno. When the two trains hit, diesel fuel gushed out of the Amtrak tanks and spewed into a gaping hole in the lead mark car. The scene was um, probably one of the more devastating things that a firefighter will encounter. You have a large area that's involved. You have fire that's in two different areas. You have victims that are injured. You talk about the big one occurring, and just initially, as soon as it went out, you could tell that this was, this was going to be a serious incident. I said, man, this is an accident. I don't know where I got all this religion from, but I mean, it was just coming out of me. Lord, what, what are we going to do? And it was an interesting situation just to try to get into the train because the way it was ripped open, every time you took a step, your foot would fall through the floor. Once we got in, we advanced our line up through the train and knocked the rest of the fire that was in there. As the smoke began to clear, the firefighters discovered a gruesome scene. There were pretty much bodies everywhere you stepped. Uh, you crawl over one, you crawl into another, you crawl over that body, onto another body. which was, it was a strange feeling. I mean, you've felt bodies in a house fire before, you know, one or two, but it was strange to feel body after body. Three crew members and eight passengers died that night. The National Transportation Safety Board immediately launched an investigation. A yellow warning signal 10 miles from the impact zone should have told the Mark engineer to slow down and give the right-of-way to the Amtrak train. After the Mark engineer stopped his train at the Kensington station, he then accelerated to 60 miles an hour, forgetting about the caution signal. The Amtrak passenger liner had switched tracks to pass a slower-moving freight train. By the time the Mark train engineer hit his emergency brakes, he was only 1,100 feet away from disaster. When the investigators completed their work, another safety problem became evident. Autopsies revealed that many of the passengers were killed by flames and smoke, and not by the impact of the crash. We know that eight of those 11 people did not die in the crash itself from trauma. They died from either smoke inhalation or smoke and fire damage. What we also know is that the people were not able, those that survived the initial crash, were not able to get out of the cars. I was appalled when I saw how difficult it would be for any, any person to get out of those cars. There were, there were some emergency windows marked, but they were poorly marked, and without emergency lighting, which had failed in this case, it would be almost impossible for people to find them. So just, just think about that. Smoke, fire, darkness, people can't breathe. I mean, it would be almost impossible for anyone to get out. 
And that's exactly what happened. Today, at least half of the windows in passenger cars are emergency escape exits designed for easy removal. Instructions on the outside of the train tell rescue workers how to use a fire axe to strip away window frames. Exterior doors are now much easier to open and they have a clearly marked emergency lever. I think everybody's affected by what they see at these instances. Uh, I'm not, I don't care how strong or how great you think you are, you're affected forever by these incidents. I've been in the fire service 32 years and I've seen some pretty horrific things. And I think that, that night that you see an incident like this, no one comes away that's not unchanged. Sometimes it is a combination of factors that leads to disaster. Circumstances that no train engineer can control. Events that no passenger can ever imagine. In the fall of 1992, three childhood friends in Southern California decided to take the trip of a lifetime. We started planning our trip about six months prior to us leaving in end of September. And we had heard about this great package deal that Amtrak had offered. So what we decided on was picking New Orleans, then going to Orlando, Florida, the Epcot Center, going to Washington, D.C., and then come straight across the states back to California. The friends left Los Angeles on Amtrak's Sunset Limited for a two-week trip to Miami. A week into the trip, they were speeding through the swampy bayous of Alabama. I kept commenting to Angie and to the girls, it was already late at night, that look at, look at on both sides, there's the bayou, there's water on the one side, there's water on the other side, and we're going over the bridge, it's so shiny, it's, it's really nice, it's really beautiful. The passengers on the Amtrak Sunset Limited, all 220 people, were in the dark about the danger on the rails ahead. As the Sunset Limited crossed an 80-year-old bridge just outside of Mobile, Alabama, the passengers heard a crashing sound. I knew we had wrecked only because, I mean, the whole train was just going crazy. All I felt was the train rocking and rolling, and uh, then it came to a sudden screech. I saw a car in front of us in, on fire. I saw fire through the doors, and then it disappeared. In an instant, a peaceful train ride across country was transformed into a fiery nightmare. Three of the cars hurtled off the bridge, down into the alligator and snake-infested waters. One of the locomotives blew up, and a large fireball began to engulf the train. The conductor called 911. The cars are exploding at that time, and there's cars that are just laying on their side, and you see the fire coming out of the windows. Uh, you hear people screaming, and you saw people in the water, people were jumping in the water trying to save the people that were in there. And at that time, a lot of people panicked, of course. The people that were in back of us, in front of us, we did not know what way to go. We did not know where we were at. Some people literally ran into the front, the things opened. People like, actually fell into the water. By daybreak, hundreds of rescuers had pitched in to work on the worst train crash in Amtrak's history. Seasoned investigators, people who have seen countless wrecks, were shaken by the scenes in the bayou. And when we saw it, we just couldn't believe it. You know, cars submerged, cars in the water, bodies being collected uh, on a barge. Never seen anything like it. It's just unbelievable.
47 people died in the disaster, and at least 100 more suffered serious injuries. It took months to determine the cause of the accident. An investigation revealed that a tugboat pushing a barge had run into the bridge moments before the Sunset Limited crossed the tracks. Because of the dense fog, the tugboat captain had no idea that he had hit the bridge. Computer animation reveals the sequence of events. The force of the impact displaced the rails. Moments later, the Sunset Limited struck the misaligned rails and launched into the air, plunging into the murky waters of the bayou. The train was moving at over 80 miles an hour. There was nothing the engineer could do. The locomotive hit the end of the girder, launched into the air, and drove itself 50 feet into the mud on the far side of the bayou. As a result of the accident, the NTSB made several safety recommendations to ensure that such a tragedy does not occur again. This bridge was, was within half a mile of a major waterway. It had no lights on it. There was no protection in the channel to prevent tows from coming up in that direction. Some of the recommendations that we made asked the Coast Guard to take a look at these waterways and take a look at the bridges and uh, try to make a determination of what the level of risk is to these bridges. Once you know the risk, then you can decide which need uh, protection from errant barges and other things. I think this, like almost all the accidents that we investigate, was preventable. And if uh, through regulations we can get uh, a higher level of um, safety, uh, then I think that's what we need to do. I think uh, that everybody can do a better job in that area. The most common and deadly rail accidents in the United States occur at railway crossings. Most railroad deaths are not caused by one train hitting another, but by trains hitting cars and buses. but people ignore the danger. In the United States, once every 90 minutes, a vehicle and a train collide. In 1996, there were over 4,000 rail crossing accidents. 472 people were killed and over 1,500 were seriously injured. Even though warning signs are everywhere, many people just ignore them. Some survive, like the driver of this truck that stopped on a rail crossing for over two minutes. But thousands aren't so lucky. A demonstration conducted by the National Transportation Safety Board shows why. When a 2,000-pound vehicle and a 200,000-pound locomotive collide, there is no contest. No seatbelt, no airbag, no child safety seat, not even a roll bar is enough to protect a passenger in this type of collision. What it comes down to is a train traveling at 40 miles an hour um, is, is very, very massive and a, a 1,000 or 2,000, 3,000 pound automobile doesn't have a chance under those conditions. That's why we have so many devastating grade crossing accidents. But the comparison that I like is a train hitting an automobile at a grade crossing from 40 miles per hour is about the same as you hitting uh, a sparrow in your automobile.
I think that people all too often assume that there will not be a train coming. They should always expect a train, and all too often um, in our complacency and getting from place to place, we forget that there's a crossing within a few miles of our own home. Most people don't give crossing railroad tracks a second thought. However, with over 260,000 railway crossings in the United States, nearly everyone has a chance to become a statistic. This home video shot at a suburban station outside of Chicago is an example of people ignoring warning signals. With bells ringing and horns blowing, people still cross the tracks. The woman in black is the only person to heed the warnings. Unfortunately, the next two people are not as cautious. Many fail to realize that even a slow-moving train can't stop quickly and that it can't steer to avoid a collision. It can't swerve. It can't go anywhere. The responsibility for avoiding a collision really falls to the motorist because the motorist can stop. It takes several hundred feet to stop a car or even a, a semi-truck, but it takes more than a mile to stop a train. One tragedy in Fox River Grove, Illinois, brought the dangers of railway crossings to the forefront of public concern. On October 25, 1995, a school bus full of 34 rambunctious children was running late. A substitute driver was filling in on the route for the very first time. The bus stopped at a traffic light, a routine event. The driver didn't realize that the back of the bus was still sitting over the railroad tracks. The train engineer saw the bus slowly going over the tracks, and his testimony at the public hearing was, I said, oh God, keep moving. And the bus did keep moving very slowly, and then it stopped. And when it stopped, the train engineer slammed the train into emergency, approximately 500 feet from the grade crossing. The train slammed into the stopped bus, ripping the bus body off of the chassis. The body flew 42 feet. Emergency crews rushed to the scene and began the gruesome task of tending to the injured and pulling out the dead. Five children died immediately. Two more were fatally injured. Ten had serious injuries. The NTSB investigation confirmed that there was not enough room between the signal and the train tracks for the bus to stop. There were no signs there to tell the bus driver how much space there was on the other side, and in fact there was about 35 feet of space. The bus is 39 feet long. And at the last minute she looked in the mirror, saw the students running forward, and that's when the impact occurred. Graphic test footage of a staged crash demonstrates the deadly results of a train colliding with a bus. Railway crossings will remain a potential danger as long as pedestrians and motorists continue to ignore warning signals. The fact of the matter is, if you see the train, don't take the risk. Wait till it goes by. A train moving at 55 miles an hour is clearing 88 feet per second. And uh, if you think about that, a second is not a very long period of time. It might take you a couple of minutes for a, a freight train that's a mile long to go by, and that's there a couple of minutes that could save your life. Super speed train designers have come up with a variety of solutions to maintain safety while still pushing the limits of speed. France's method was to build a completely integrated rail system dedicated solely to high-speed travel. The train, the track, the communication and control system, all elements of the TGV network are fused together and aim toward the goal of moving people very fast and safely. 
A French railway accident helped spur the use of this futuristic system that could make rail travel safer worldwide. The accident that spawned the development of modern railway communication and tracking occurred on June 27, 1988, during rush hour at the Gare de Lyon station in Paris. A brakeless train flew down into the station at over 60 miles an hour. 30 feet below the city streets, unsuspecting commuters slowly boarded their daily train. The out-of-control locomotive hurtled toward the waiting commuter train. The train at Gare de Lyon was the classic runaway train. Uh, its brakes uh, had failed because of the driver's action. Uh, nobody established quite why he had done this or what was in his mind, but there's no question that he did do it. And from that point on, uh, he had no control of that train. He had uh, no means of stopping it. And uh, in fact, he, he, he just panicked. And uh, he didn't even uh, try to use his motors in reverse to, to slow the train down. The runaway train plowed into the sitting train, killing 59 people and injuring 32 more. Within weeks of the Gare de Lyon disaster, Two more railway accidents shook the confidence of the French people. The president of the French railway system was forced to resign, and a comprehensive package of safety initiatives was recommended. The thing that the people cannot understand is how nowadays, in 1988 for instance, it is still possible that mistakes this big can be made, that we don't yet have the technology to get over these situations and to deal with them. The technology is now in place. Today, commuter trains in Paris use satellites to provide continuous location reports on suburban routes. These reports are monitored to ensure that trains are where they should be and are not hurtling toward disaster. A similar system is being evaluated in the United States. In the Pacific Northwest, several railroads are taking a look at the feasibility of bringing the iron horse into the space age. Germany is tackling the problem of safe rail travel by building a train that travels using levitation. Steel, track, and wheels have been replaced by magnetic fields. The maglev has been designed to run on guideways, each section elevated as needed to avoid any dangerous crossings or geography. The trains travel in only one direction on the track so there could never be a head-on collision. Because of the way the maglev is powered, there is always a distance of at least 20 miles between two trains, so one train could not rear-end another. In addition, the trains wrap around the guideway, so it is impossible to derail. However, even the best technology can be undermined by someone committed to inflicting harm. On October 9, 1995, in the remote desert outside of Phoenix, Arizona, an Amtrak train bound from Los Angeles to Miami sailed over a trestle spanning a gulch. Suddenly, the train's 248 passengers were plunged into the ravine. One crew member was killed, and over 100 passengers were injured. An investigation revealed that the derailment was caused by sabotage. Someone had removed a three-foot joint that connects rail segments. They overrode the emergency warning system by using a wire to keep the electrical connection between the separated pieces of track. With no break in electrical current, the engineer received no warning. Investigators believe this terrorist act was inspired by a similar crash that occurred almost 60 years ago. 
On August 12, 1939, the city of San Francisco, one of the premier passenger trains of its time, was derailed by someone who disconnected a section of track. 24 people died in the accident. The saboteur used the same method to bypass the alarm system. To this day, both wrecks remain unsolved mysteries. It's very difficult to police uh, all these different areas and, and prevent this type of, of occurrence, especially if someone is intent on uh, derailing a train. Railroad officials and most safety experts agree that the railroads have come a long way from the reckless days of the mid-19th century. If you look at the accident rate for the railroads, um, the accident rate is dropping. I would say that, that we are using technology to find lots of the problems that we used to have in the past. Whether it is the use of satellite technology, better brakes, or more training, with so many lives at stake, rail safety is of the utmost concern. Each year, new systems are tested and implemented in the hopes of someday preventing all rail fatalities. People always say, well, you know, the railroad system is getting safer. When is it going to be safe enough? And in looking at this, you have to say that the railroad is going to be safe enough when the preventable accidents are prevented.